Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. It's Dr. Ashley Pokler, and she is a clinical um, advisor, in her, and she is just an amazing person. She is part of our podcast community, and she has her own podcast underneath our channel. She has amazing podcasts, and she talks about a lot of different topics, and today she really wants to go into talking about how we should really challenge our kids, and by challenging them, we can actually, you know, help them, make them into better adults, and, and we can actually make them stronger, and in the long run, also help them when they have stressful situations in life, that they'll be able to actually handle those stressful situations because a lot of times parents will, you know, in a, a lot, in, we see it in today's society, they don't, you know, want to challenge their kids, or they don't want to put their kids out there to, you know, and let them go and, and try, you know, new challenging events, and they're scared. But these things could actually help your child. And she's going to explain that today. So Ashley, I'm so excited that you came on the show today. And I'm really excited to learn about why challenging children can actually benefit us in the long run and actually make our children better as they grow into productive teens, tweens, and, you know, and they go into their adulthood years. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And this is one of those topics that I find myself speaking to a lot um, while also struggling with doing it as a parent. Yeah. Now, you know, you talk about like, you know, you had mentioned a story you were telling me before, and I thought it was amazing. And you had, um, cause you belong to a foundation and organization and you help people with disabilities and you brought your children with you and you actually had them participate in certain events. And it really, you know, it really made a positive impact on their lives. Can you share that story with us? Yeah, absolutely. So as part of Sentinel Foundation, um, we partnered with several other organizations, 59 children and young adults who had varying levels of physical and or intellectual disabilities. We removed them from an orphanage in Haiti and took them to an orphanage, uh, Mustard Seed Communities, that was willing to open their door to 59 young people with severe needs. Um, and so in my role as clinical director, it's really my job to make sure that um, we're thinking about the children first, that we're thinking about their well being, not just in the rescue, but afterwards. Um, and so it was really important for me to get down to Jamaica and to just have eyes on so that I could tell owners without a shadow of doubt that yes, money that you put towards rescuing these orphans from Haiti has been put to good use and they are in a better situation now than they were before. Because the reality is, about 80 to 90% of individuals that have been in exploitative situations end up in additional exploitative uh, situations because their risk levels are so much higher. Um, so I was going anyways, and I made the decision to take my children with me. Um, and there were people who were like, what are you thinking? Why would you take them to, um, to another country for work instead of going to Jamaica for the beaches? And the reality is we saw the ocean at dinner one day. We didn't touch sand at all. Um, it was a very short visit, but we stayed in where the missionaries stay. So we slept in basically cabins um, with bunk beds or, or twin beds. Um, and we lived with these young people that we were going to interact with and, and adults in and, and one of the settings. And my children um, fed young people that were in wheelchairs and they sang songs to them and they engaged with them and they held their hands. Um, and it was really interesting to see the growth in each of my children. So my, my youngest, he's He's the baby, he's the only boy, and he like embodies the baby of the family. Like I couldn't hold babies when he was a toddler because he's the baby. Um, so yeah. I knew he, I, I knew he would struggle with it, but instead of helicoptering, instead of doing what my heart was telling him to do and protecting him and letting him sit off to the side, I encouraged him to, to interact. I purposely didn't, um, go and save him when people would come over and interact with him and you could tell he was uncomfortable it was not it was not an it, it was not his idea of fun time to begin with especially the first few times people came and hugged him um one young lady came hugged him and she hugged him so hard that she lifted him off the ground and he was like this and you could tell he was uncomfortable but i had eyes on he he was safe 
he was uncomfortable, but he was safe. And I think that's something we can talk about, the difference between those two. Um, but by the end, he was telling stories to my husband and to our friend about the kids and about how they smiled with him and about how he got them to laugh and about how he understood what one of them was trying to say when nobody else did. Um, for my girls, uh, my middle daughter, I think she basically has become a missionary at heart from this experience and she dove in. She handled things without asking. She asked the workers what she could do to help without me encouraging her to. And at some point, and, and we can talk about where that line is. I think it's different for different kids. But at some point, letting the leash a little bit and allowing them to figure out their own way and their own path is, is valuable and important. And this experience is a place where most most people aren't sending their kids to, to go do missionary type work at the ages of 10, 11, 12. Um, and, and honestly, this missionary doesn't usually allow kids that age. They, they open their door for the children because of my role. Um, but I think it might have highlighted for them just how powerful it can be to have younger kids doing those kinds of activities as well. Yeah, you know, I think it's a great idea. I think a lot of times we don't really give credit to how strong our children are. And by witnessing, you know, underprivileged children and children with disabilities and children who are struggling, I think it brings a sense of appreciation and, and you realize what you, you know, what you do have and what others don't have. And you also are, you know, you become empathetic and, you know, you, you know, we come from a society where we, you know, people don't realize, but we, we have a lot in our country in the United States and people take that for granted. They don't even realize you know, when you go to other countries, uh, you know, that are not as privileged as us, you see the difference, you see how they live and you see, you know, that, you know, you are privileged, you know, and you get an idea of, you know, fr from being in other countries, third world countries. But, you know, when children get to experience this, I think it, it gives them a sense of gratitude, empathy, it gives them care. You know, these are things that every human being should have. And I think by by exposing your children at such a young age, I think it actually helps them, you know, become a better person, I think. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, there's an argument that I've kind of played both sides of around empathy and whether or not empathy is something that you're born with or something that can be taught. And while some of us are born with um, a stronger capacity for empathy to come naturally, the reality is it can be taught, um, but it requires some of those difficult conversations. For example, the first night um, we stayed at a place that was all of the children, all of the young people were wheelchair bound. Most of them were nonverbal. And so my son just kept on saying, um, how could their parents just leave them? How could their parents, why would their parents do that to them? Why would their parents take care of them? Because we heard stories of them being left in um, hospital or just left on the side of the street. And opening doors to these experiences and building his empathy requires me as the parent to be comfortable having those kinds of difficult conversations. And I right. think that that's where um, my generation of parents, um, at least in my experience, being a therapist for teenagers and younger, um, we're missing the mark, a lot of us, and being able and willing to have these kinds of tough conversations because we want to protect our child. We don't want our child to experience hard things or to know um, the dangers of the world. Um, but if we don't teach them that who's going to, besides the danger in the world, eventually catching up to them. Right, exactly. I, I, I think it's really important that they understand, you know, what's going on in the world and, you know, they're not blinded to it. I feel like a lot of times I've noticed that, you know, parents bubbleize their children. And then when they get into the real world, they're not prepared. You know, they are, you know, they get anxiety and they get, and they get, you know, they, they just don't know how to cope with situations. And, um, you know, they just have a very hard time, you know, becoming productive because they have not 
you know, have been challenged in their childhood years. And, and, and it, it, you know, it's instead of making it uh, by bubbleizing them, they didn't make them like strong individuals. And so therefore, when they had, you know, moments of, you know, trial and error, where they had to be, you know, make, you know, certain decisions, and they had to react, and they had to behave a certain way, and, and, you know, and really face their challenges, they were unable to because of the way they were sheltered when they were younger. I've actually seen that. I worked in a high school setting um, for a couple of years, and it was a predominantly wealthy um, student body. And honestly, most of the work I did in that space was all around boundary setting. These young people did not know how to say, I don't really want to be your friend, or I'm not interested in you in this way. Instead, they would come to me as the school psychologist and ask me to set the boundaries for them because they've never had to set boundaries. They've never been taught to set boundaries. Their parents did it for them. Their teachers did it for them. The structured play, the structured sports did it for them. And so they, they never really learned how to do that. And when I would encourage them, you know, have you have you had that conversation with this person? They'd something like, no, I blocked them. I'm like, I don't know that they're getting it. Let's practice having a conversation. And they would say things like, oh no, you do it. It's an awkward conversation. So again, it goes back to that being uncomfortable, feeling awkward is not the same as being unsafe. You're not yeah. in danger by feeling awkward or uncomfortable. But somehow along the way, that's what we've taught them, that if you feel uncomfortable, that it's a dangerous situation and you need an adult to fix it for you. But here they are, seniors in high school, almost adults going to college in the next year, and they don't know how to have that conversation. And scarily enough, I've had parents call me after I've had those conversations with teens and tell me not to, and that they don't agree, and that I shouldn't put their child into an unsafe situation. Yeah, and, and, and I've seen that, you know, children with, you know, that are becoming young adults, you know, they just have panic attacks, and they can't, you know, they'll call their parents, in, you know, in the middle of the night, or they'll call, you know, they'll even as adults, and they will be having a panic attack, and their their parents will have to calm them down, you know, as adults, because they can't, handle the pressure of life you know so it's it's really a, you know i feel personally it's important that we give our ch children the opportunities to put them into challenging situations and sometimes it's even good to let them fall and you're just behind them and let them get up by themselves because then i think it makes them a stronger individual and they realize that hey life isn't perfect and if something happens you know I can still you know overcome you know whereas if the parents are constantly chain you know catching them and not letting them fall what's going to happen when they do because eventually when they get out in the real world you know life isn't you know a bowl of cherries yeah and they will come into situations many times in their life where they're going to have obstacles facing them and what are they going to do quoting um, Dr. Winnicott often. It's one of my favorite parenting quotes. I think we might have discussed it last time. I mean, that's good enough. Parenting is good enough. And while I, while I tell myself that when I don't feel like I'm being perfect, there's also this other underlying piece of it that when you're striving too hard to be perfect and you're trying too hard to fix all of the bumps ahead of your child, you're not going to develop the way that they need to because part of development especially the social emotional development is making mistakes and figuring things out. And if we don't give them the opportunity to do that, they don't successfully meet that developmental stage, which means all the other ones are not going to happen like they're supposed to either. Right. Right. No, I, I agree totally. And what is some of your advice for parents? You know, because a lot of parents, you know, I see in today's society, they they hover over their children and they consistently let their children do whatever they want. They bubbleize them. And, and you know, so so what's your what's your advice for parents? If you really want to have a, a strong uh, child that's going to be able to take care of themselves, especially, you know, when you're gone and you pass on, you want to know that your child is going to be safe. Your child is strong enough to handle its own that they're strong enough to have a family and and take care of that family by themselves what's your advice as hard as it is back off <laughs> um, i so for me 
Um, I started when they were young. It's way easier to start when they're young than to go and fix it later. Um, so like our kids used to play in the in the playroom with friends and they would want the parents to fix any of the arguments that they had. You know, parents would be called down anytime somebody's feelings were hurt or somebody was upset. And I implemented a, are you bleeding? Is somebody non-responsive um, or is a bone again? And if the answer to those three is no, then problem solved figure it out yourselves. And if you can't, then you're going to have to come and do a chore or something like that. So I basically made it in my husband and I both um, in such a way that figuring out solutions to your own problem is going to be way better than coming inside, having mommy fix it and have to do the dishes or have to brush the dog. Um, and so we forced the problem solving and then we talk to them after. And so that, that's the added piece. Like it's not just they're out you know, throw them to the wolves. It's let them stumble and try and then come together after to talk through, how was that? How did you handle that? Do you feel like that was the best way to handle it? Um, and so just setting up little moments of failure that aren't life altering. And I think that's where as parents, we don't want to see our kids fail, but let's be honest. Failing um, a test in third grade is going to be way less problematic than failing a test in college or failing a test in high school. And so allowing them to stumble and to fall early and often early teaches them the skills and the strategies they need to manage those disruptions later in life. And our role as a parent isn't to protect them from falling. Our role as a parent is to teach them how to manage the outcomes of the falling and teach them how to get back up. I like that. You know, I think, it, and I especially like the fact that you, you um, mentioned that let them fall, let them, you know, let them, you know, go ahead, you know, go head on with the challenge and then, you know, um, and then later, you know, discuss, you know, well, how did it make you feel? You know, did, were you scared? You know, why did you decide to do this? You know, did it help? You know, and then, and then, you know, go on with the conversation and interact with them and, uh, you know, have them, you know, share how they felt. And then, you know, you, you can share how you felt and also give them advice for the next time, but let them experience it. So they, you know, when it does happen again, they're not so paranoid or scared or panicky because they've been through it already, you know, and, the more they they try and the more they discuss it with you, the more information they're going to get, the more knowledge they're going to attain, and it will make them more resilient in the end. If you want to keep that space where failure is okay, if we're constantly keeping them from failing and we're acting like failure is the end of the world, when they inevitably fail, when they inevitably fall, they're not going to feel comfortable coming to us to talk to us about it. You know, there's a saying, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. Yeah. We want them to fail in the little problem and to feel like failure is a way of growth because it is like we don't learn without failure. We don't learn without messing up. Not, not truly like we might think we do until we fall. Um, and so we want that to happen when it's little problems so that when there are those inevitable big problems, they see us as a joint support, not as a judgment or somebody who will be disappointed or those kinds of things. Right. Exactly. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, you know, from your own experience, you know, when parents hover over their children, you mentioned one ex one example, you know, what are some other examples when, when parents, you know, are con consistently trying to solve the problem for their children, they're consistently trying to, anything they think is bad in their opinion, they're trying to shield their children away from it. You know, what do you see happening, you know, from your own experience as a clinical director, you know, what do, what do you see happening, in, you know, to children as they grow older? One of the things I noticed is that when parents, we talked about them not being able to set boundaries, but they also just don't have the basic social skills that you would expect for that age because their parents manage all of the in-group arguments. You know, it's the parents that are calling each other to fix the friend group drama instead of the kids fixing the friend group drama. And so they're not learning those skills and strategies that really prepare them for the real world and for the world of work. And so often I see young adults 
who can't maintain a job because they don't know how to navigate difficult conversations with their bosses or with their colleagues. And so as soon as they feel uncomfortable, they quit the job because yeah. parents are all back and it's, it's, it's uncomfortable equals unsafe. And so it's not a safe working environment. And so they leave. Um, so it's a, I see a lot of young people that don't lean into spaces of growth because growth is uncomfortable. And so honestly, they kind of get stuck in that like tween teen developmental stage and don't really come out of it, which leads them to unhealthy interpersonal relationships with boyfriends or girlfriends as well, um, because they're still functioning as if they're young teenagers. Um, another space that I work in often is um, sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. And when parents um, over bubble wrap and manage everything, that's when teenagers start to hide things and start to lie and start to have secret phones. And when you set up such a structured environment, um, they don't know how to act or what to do or even what they're looking for, what they're worried about because you never talked about the scary thing because you were protecting them. And so yeah. the scary thing find them and they don't know to talk about it because you never had those conversations. And so um, youth who are bubble wrapped like that tend to um, appear as a more um, shiny possible object of exploitation to groomers and you know, I, I, you see that all the time. And, you know, what are some of the suggestions you have for parents? Like, what are some of the suggestions that parents should really, you know, some, you know, some realizations and, and some solutions, because I'm sure that we see when, when parents behave like, you know, and with certain ways they have good intentions, but in the long run, it, it's, it, it just, it ends up harming the child rather than helping the child. You know, what are your suggestions to help, you know, really create a strong independent child that that grows up into a, a, you know, a strong independent adult you know, that is able to handle challenges in their life. Yeah. So one of the things that really helped me, um, especially as my kids are becoming into those teenage years, my oldest is 14. Um, and like I said, I'm really good about talking about all this. I struggle a little bit more with making it happen for my own family. Um, yeah. One of the things that helps me a lot is understanding developmental stages. So having that background knowledge of what they're supposed to be figuring out in this time frame helps me to kind of check myself of am I getting in the way of them doing what their brain is telling them to do and once they hit that once they hit that teen it really is they're figuring out who they are separate from me which means that I can't tell them what to think and what to believe and that, yeah. that leads to the second um, suggestion and that is um, checking myself or yourself as the parent, checking your own um, kind of triggers or spaces where you're like, oh, nobody did this for me as a teen. And that's why this bad thing happened. And what are my fears? What did I read that has me acting this way? And managing my own emotional reactivity before I interact with my children. Um, yeah. And then the final piece is trying my best to see my kids as individuals. Um, it's really hard because you see them as yours and it's so hard to separate their baby self from this, this human and you want them to hold all the things that you value and that you want them to, to be mini you and to, and to think how you think and to feel how you think or feel how you feel. They're not going to because they're individuals. And so forcing myself to allow them to voice their own opinions, allowing them to disagree with me, which is really hard as a parent and not yeah. getting mad when they disagree with me, asking what they think and actually listening to what they think without telling them what I think. Um, as they become teenagers, that becomes more and more important as they try to figure out who they are. They're only going to become independent if you let them figure out who they are as a person. Yes. Oh, I agree so much. I, I, you know, I, I think it's so important that we, we give them, we let them grow up and we let them, you know, face challenges and we let them, you know, face their fears. And I, I think it really helps them grow into strong adults. If you look back, you know, when we go from our grandparents and even our parents, you know, um, they did not, you know, they were not pampered, you know, they were, they came from a tough generation and they had, you know, they, they were expected 
wanted to, you know, to do certain things. And there was no bubbleization back then, you know, and they grew up to be very good, strong individuals. And they, you know, they were all, you know, many of them were, you know, re resilient and, 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 you know, clear minded and, and they were go getters and hard workers. And that was from letting them be who they want to be. And, 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 you know, really, you know, setting the boundaries, there was really no boundaries. It was to, you know, help support the family, help to do this, help to do that. And, you know, it was more of a, of a partnership, you know, and really, you know, the, the kids, had you know they had high expectations on their children and you know and they and the children met those high expectations you know but you know I think I think one of the worst things we can do and I see it so much in today's generation is that they they pamper the children and and a lack of discipline you know they they let the kids do whatever I see a lot of times you know they don't really set down the law you know I'm not saying everybody but I see that a lot that, you know, they don't set, you know, the, the boundaries down. They don't, you know, the discipline, there is a lack of discipline. I think a lot of times, you know, and you hear controversy, well, just, you know, discipline isn't really good and you shouldn't give your kid time out and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. Well, then, you know, how do children learn, you know, you know, that there's consequences with bad behavior if there is no discipline? Yeah. It's interesting because if you look up anything to do with parenting, you're pretty much damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> there's no right way to do it. And, and honestly, there's a lot of there's a lot of different good enough ways to do it. Um, I, I think it's, you know, people have asked me why I think parenting looks the way it does now. And I really think it's a generational reality where each generation previously wants what's best for the kids. And so they look at what went wrong in their upbringing and try to fix it. And honestly, in, in the generation that I'm in, the, and, and like older than me, the worst that happened is we didn't feel heard or seen by our parents because our parents were working to, to provide for us. That That's the worst, um, unless we have some sort of trauma history or that kind of thing. But honestly, the parents who have a trauma history, they tend to build their children to be strong and to be resilient because they value that. Um, yeah. But for those who didn't, the worst was the child didn't feel seen or heard or understood. So now we have the participation trophies. Now we have, let's not feel uncomfortable because to us, that was the worst part of our childhood. And we're doing what all parents do, trying to make our child, our child's life better than our life was. Right, right. You know, how, how do you feel, you know, about today and how children are, you know, are, are disciplined? Is there, you know, in your eyes, do you feel that, you know, from what you've seen in the clinic and what you've seen in your own experiences, you know, are there, are there certain techniques that you, you see work better with children than other techniques? Yeah, I, I think that the techniques that include a very clear, if this behavior, then this consequence. And that it's separate from my emotions as a parent, that tends to work best. Whether it is um, taking away of cell phones, whether it is a timeout, whether it is uh, um, time away from friends, whatever it is that we're deciding is the consequence, it works well as long as the parent actually engages in the consequence. Um, right. It doesn't work well if you keep saying, you do this again, then this, and then nothing happens. I'm going to count to three. One, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. And so what I often, and I have to ask myself too, don't give, don't say you're going to give a consequence unless you're willing to give it. Like I have to check myself. I'm not going to tell my kids that they're not going to visit grandma for the weekend. They're not going to um, the local fair if I want to go to it, because if I tell them they'll lose it and they lose it, I got to stay with them. And they quickly, kids are smart. They, they will push the bins and they will push the boundaries. And as soon as they realize that whatever consequence you're giving them is not going to happen, it is a free for all because they know yes. the worst that'll happen is you yell at them. Oh no. Right. 
Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the biggest problems I think it is, is that, you know, they give consequences. I see a lot of times with parenting and they don't follow through. And I think that's the biggest thing is when you don't follow through, like you mentioned, I think, you know, kids are like very smart, just like you said, and they realize, oh, there is no consequence. So I'm just going to keep doing this and doing this and doing this. And, you know, and, and also how do you feel about, you know, a lot of times I will see, you know, parents yell at their children, you know, and, and they will blow their their temper, but they're they're yelling at their children. You know, what do you see from your own experience working in the clinics and working with so many children when parents are instead of having a conversation and trying to maybe take a moment to cool themselves down and they just go off and they start yelling, you know, what are the consequences and, and what do you see happen in that relationship and maybe in the future future behavior of that child that when as they're turned into adults? So that's the other side of it. You know, if you're giving the the reaction without having thought about it ahead of time, if they do this, here's what we, here's the response. That's when we get the yelling or when parents themselves are just overwhelmed. And again, I am guilty uh, of yelling as well as I'm sure all parents are. And it's yeah. when I myself am triggered, when they, when I feel like I'm not um, being a good parent or when I feel like a disrespect or those kinds of things that's when when the yelling uh tends to show its head um and the outcomes um a lot of the teens that i work with who have parents who are more of a, a yelling parent they don't trust their parent they don't go to their parents when things are going bad or when things are wrong because their assumption is their parents going to yell at them and a lot right. of parents do yell when they're disappointed or do yell when they're worried about the safety of their child because they're emotional and they just want their kid to be safe. Um, but that's not what the kid's hearing. The kid is not hearing, I love you so much that I'm being irrationally emotive right now. All they <laughs> hear is, wow, nothing I do is ever good enough or ever right. Um, right. And so they tend to be more the internalizing kid um, and they tend to keep it all inside. They just don't tell parents um, what's going on. Um, or if they're if it's been happening since they're younger they learn that's how you deal with feelings and so the child themselves becomes a yeller as well and they express all of their emotions in these big emotive ways that become problematic in social situations and in schools and the work yeah i i've noticed those two behaviors either they they copy their parents behavior even you know a lot of times i've seen where they knew that the behavior is wrong but because they've been in the environment so so long it you know it became so natural that you know they it, in their head it's like i guess this is normal you know um you know because they've been in the environment they just copy the behavior of their parents and then i've seen the opposite where i've seen children become introverts and they just don't share their emotions they're just very introverted and they just pretty much they're within themselves you know and they're not overly social they're not they're not really you know um overly overly uh you know friendly and expressive with their words, you know, but they, they, you know, they, they are caring and loving individuals. It's just that they're more internalized than externalized. And, you know, I, I, it's, it, it's, it's kind of sad. And I, I feel like, you know, we all, like you said, we all have moments where we just lose it, you know, it's just normal. But I, I think, you know, you know, parents sometimes have to try to do our best as, you know, cause we are human to maybe take a moment, a breather, you know, to calm ourselves down a moment and then try to do our best to, you know, try to handle it. I think in a, in a calmer way, if we can. Yeah, I put myself in timeout sometimes. Um, my <laughs> youngest daughter, my third child, is um, the one that activates the most frustration for me. And so yeah. there are times that I will have to say, you know what? Mommy's going to take a timeout because mommy is losing her, her ability to control herself. And I will go and like separate myself because, again, I'm the adult. Yes. I should be the one who's doing that. And I'm modeling for her. When you're feeling this way, instead of continuing this argument, it's helpful for both of us to take a break. And then I think something else that parents don't do enough of is apologize. <laughs> um, so when I do lose it, when when you do lose it, because you will inevitably lose it, to come yeah. to the table when everybody's calm 
um, and and to allow that child to decide. Like, if they're not ready for that conversation, they have the right to have their feelings hurt by how I responded. They have yeah. the right to not want to talk to me. But when everybody's calm and ready, I, I think it is important to say, you know what? Mommy did not handle her emotions well at all. You know how I talked to you about taking deep breaths? I should have taken deep breaths and just own it and apologize for it and acknowledge that my words and the way I use them hurt you. And you had every right to respond the way you did because I was being hurtful and moms shouldn't harm their kids with their words. Right. Exactly. And I think that's the biggest problem too, is like, I, I see that a lot, you know, uh, sometimes children, you know, just would like to be, you know, when they feel like, you know, the situation wasn't right, you know, and maybe both people were wrong, you know, maybe the child was wrong in some areas and the parent was wrong in some areas, but to hear the parent admit their wrongs, it, one, it, it's a great, it's a great mentorship. It's a great example, you know, to be able to have the, the courage and to be able to acknowledge your wrongs, you know, and say, you know, what I'm sorry I overreacted I was upset you know um yeah I shouldn't have done it this way you know and, and sometimes I think kids just look for that you know they just you know they feel they feel hurt they feel upset by maybe certain words that were said or actions that were taken and they're just looking to you know hear the words I'm sorry you know or I'm wrong I, I'm wrong I, I was wrong and, you know, people do not like to admit when they're wrong for whatever reason, but it, it it heals the wound so much quicker. And it actually is a great way to be a good mentor, you know, for your child, because then your child grows up saying, you know what, it's okay to admit when you're wrong. It doesn't make me any less worthy. You know, I, you know, it's okay, you know, and that's a great way to establish healthy relationships in the future is when you're able to admit that you're wrong and you're able to apologize for things that you may have done to hurt another human being. Yeah, it's, you know, it goes back to um, we the helicoptering and the bubble wrapping. If you're doing all of that and then you're never actually modeling how to have those conversations, how to repair relationships, then it, it's like a double whammy for our kids. They're not falling and they're not learning how to manage those difficult things when they Right. Exactly. And, and, and that, you know, that's why you have like 70%, you know, families in the United States are dysfunctional is because we're lacking certain things in the relationships. You know, we, you know, having a child is such an important thing. You know, people, people, you know, sometimes they have children, but there's so much involved and, you know, and from the moment, you know, they're in the womb, you know, they, they take in everything, you know, so it's really, you know, as if you're deciding to have a child and you're deciding to be a parent, you really, really have to think through the motions and you really have to, you know, look at other families that look really good and, and they, you know, from, and you know, that they're healthy families and say, okay, you know, what are they doing? That's really good. And what can I take from that relationship that, you know, that family and implement into my own, because, you know, with, with over 70% of dysfunctional families in the United States, you know, obviously we're repeating the same behaviors over and over and over and over again. And, you know, there has to be a point where we have to acknowledge that yes, I'm not perfect. Yes, I'm wrong. There are certain things in the relationship that I need to work on. There are certain things about myself I need to work on. And, you know, and show your child that you can, you know, make these adjustments. And when you do do something wrong or you do make a mistake or something doesn't turn out, you're able to communicate with your child and you're really able to establish, you know, a, a good bond with that child by being able to express your, your emotions and express yourself to that child. I, I think that mindful awareness goes such a long way when it comes to parenting because the reality is if we're not if we're not being mindful of every interaction that we're having with our child, we fall back into whatever we know. Um, and whatever we know, there's always something that's not the best in that. Um, yeah. but we're not we're not even aware we're doing it. Um, I think I think there's a lot of a lot of parents get a lot of um, black for not doing things well or the best. But the reality is parents only know what they know. Like they don't know what they don't know. They grew up in whatever system they grew up in. They came from another system. They came from another system. And they don't know there's other options or other ways of being without right. um, taking the time to think about it or being challenged to think about it. 
A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you wanted to emphasize on a couple of important factors, what would be some things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners today? Yeah, uh, there, we talked about so much. Um, I think, I think, overarchingly, um, as a parent, one of the one of the best gifts you can give to your child is to let them develop. And so whether that means you're going back and reading about developmental norms so that you have an idea of what that looks like, or just stepping back and letting them kind of falter along and being a willing participant or willing support for it. Um, I, I just think the overarching is, we'll go back to good enough, parenting is good enough, which means if you yell, not a big deal, as long as you do something to repair the relationship. And it also means trying to be too perfect ensures that your child is missing out on something. So that good enough parenting is good enough from both ends, I think would be the main take takeaway. I like that. I like that a lot. Now tell everybody some of the services that you provide because you have your foundation, your organization, and you have your own services that you provide. Can you tell us a little about both? Yeah. So through Sentinel Foundation, which is an anti-sex trafficking, anti-sexual exploitation, I provide a lot of um, just liaison services. So if you're worried about your child um, or you're wondering how to best protect them or how to best support them in an appropriate, developmentally appropriate way, um, feel free to reach out to me through the website or through my email, ashley at foundationsentinel.org. And I'm happy to provide um, feedback. I also provide free psychological assessments through that organization um, for kids who have experienced trauma. So if you're an adoptive parent, foster parent or your own child has gone through some difficult uh, spaces and really struggling to figure out how to best support them in school and in the community and at home, um, I could probably be helpful with that as long as you're in a SIPAC state. Um, if not, I can help you find somebody who can provide those services. And then on the other side, um, I provide parent, so through APO Clark Ponders, which is my private um, organization, I provide uh, parent training, one-on-one, um, -on -one, like one-time calls of, this is what's going on. Am I doing it right? What could I be doing differently? Or I'm worried about my child. What should I be asking? Or I can meet with your child and provide feedback. And again, liaison you with appropriate supports in that way also. I love it. And can you tell everybody once more, you know, the, your website so they know where to go? Sure. So the, the nonprofit is um, Foundation sentinel.org and my personal one is a poklar ponders.org i love it this has been amazing ashley I, I think this was a great conversation i think it was well needed i think a lot of people you need to understand and understand the different aspects of parenting and different ways that you can go about it in a productive way that will build your child's character and your their strength and also help them through the, the rough patches in life because we all go through them in life. And we have to, you know, we learn through our, our errors and our mistakes and the obstacles that, that enter our lives. We they're all things that we learn from. And if we are under, you know, if we are resilient enough to actually be able to handle them, you know, it will make us stronger and stronger in the long run. And we'll be able to handle other things and become leaders, you know, because that's how leaders, you know, no leader has just ever just stepped up and become a leader. They have started from scratch and they've had a lot of things happen to them in the long run and they have grown and become the people they are through trial and error. So I think your conversation today was wonderful. I thank you so much for being on the show. And, you know, I can't wait to come back because I know that we have some topics that you were thinking about doing that I think were really great. And I think people are going to love them because uh, they're definitely topics that people can apply to their own family and parenting life. But today was awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley, for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.